We shall assemble on the mountain. We shall assemble at the throne with humble hearts into his presence. We bring an offering of song, glory and honor and dominion unto the Lamb, unto the King. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. We sing the song of the redeemed. Good morning. Good morning. Everybody rushing in this morning. It's great to see everybody. We're uh, especially uh, thankful for our visitors this morning. And if you are visiting with us, please hang around and we'd like to get to know you a little bit better. Also, uh, I know it doesn't seem like we have anybody in the parking lot much anymore, which is kind of a good thing. But if you are happen to be listening to us online, uh, welcome as well. And uh, we're uh, just glad to have everybody. Uh, one prayer request that uh, just came in a little bit ago uh, that we want to share this morning is that uh, Norm Hilton, uh, Tony, I'd take him up to the hospital uh, this morning with shortness of breath. So we'll be praying. Uh, I've asked our prayer person to, when they come up to pray for Norm. Also, uh, we're excited to announce that Jean Johnston was baptized on Wednesday, uh, August 3rd. Please take a moment to welcome her. Hi. Is she here? I don't, don't think I see her. Uh, friendly reminder that life groups uh, surveys are due today. Please place your surveys in Scott Lukeson's slot on the back counter. That's that big long thing. Or give them to Brittany uh, Montavo. Uh, we have a couple of sending books on the back counter. Please take a moment to wish the Hamilton family and the Terry Old Theralt family well on their next adventures. And uh, thanks for your generosity to the Montana State University Campus Ministry. Our special contribution now is at uh, $5,495. So that's pretty exciting. As you may have noticed, we are installing a ramp at the front of our office building. This will remove a longstanding safety issue and increase our mission opportunities. And uh, that's, uh, you know, that's needed to be done for a long, long time. I don't know if any of you ever tried going through the front door up over there, but the but the top step was about this high. <laughs> and uh, wasn't, it was a real hazard, and we've been wanting to get it done, so we're pretty excited about that. Uh, it's been long planned. Uh, Scott Lukeson is preaching in Lewistown this morning. Be praying for that. Also, uh, we're, uh, well, there was a couple other things. I'm sorry, I'm spacing it out here. Uh, Scott, what was, oh, the thing about the uh, office building, I already mentioned that. Uh-oh. I'm not getting old, I'm just getting forgetful. I uh, think that's it. So we'll turn it back. Let's all be standing for, uh, you got a song, Ray, for our prayer? Hello? Uh, the annual Church Olympics is coming up October, uh, August 21st. We encourage you to attend and bring friends and neighbors with you. This has always been a fun time and a great uh, method of community outreach. There are several sign-up sheets in the back. We need your help to make this uh, event a success again this year. This year there's also a barbecue master competition. We only have one person signed up and that is Ted Falat. So please uh, sign up and show off your uh, barbecuing uh, grills or your uh, skills, sorry. Your, your <laughs> grill skills. Come on and give him some competition or he'll be crowned the, the barbecue master for sure. And show us what you got. And more details will be posted on the bulletin board. Let's continue our worship this morning. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see Beauty that made this heart adore you Hope of a life spent with you Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down Here I am to say you're my God, 
You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became poor. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Light of the world, you stepped out into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. So how many of you got sidetracked with the bicycle thing this morning? I'm glad you chose to be here. The better of the two. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you, we thank you for this day that you've created. Father, we thank you for the sun that rose again this morning, that warms us, that gives us light. We thank you for creating each and everything, and we thank you for putting us in your creation to be assigned back to you, to be the glory for you, Father. Father, we ask that you be with Norm, that the doctors will find what's going on with this shortness of breath, that it'll be nothing, Father, and, and that he will be okay with that. Father, as we enter into this period, we thank you for the word that you've given us. As we worship you, Father, it's our prayer that it be a sweet melody to you, that it be pleasing to you, that we can take your word to hear it and to write it into our hearts, Father, that we can live it each and every day. We ask, Father, that you be with those who aren't here, that Whatever's prevented them, they can overcome it, Father, in return. Whether it be physical or spiritual, we know you can heal them. Father, help us to be the people that you've called us to be. As we step out into the world, let them see the light you shine through us. Help us to bring souls to you, Father. We ask that you forgive us of our sin. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. There's a wonderful place we call home. Tis a city of glory divine. In the built in the garden of rest. And that beautiful home shall be mine. Oh, that wonderful Eden so blessed, where Jesus the Master has gone to prepare us his glorious home. There he bids us a welcome to come. Oh, wonderful city of God, just across in that beautiful climb. Where the angels' sweet echo of song In musical cadences chime Oh, wonderful city of God By faith in the distance I see There's a mansion prepared over there Yes, a place in that city for me Oh, how sweet it will be there to dwell with the Savior and Father of all in a palace of diamond and gold where no evil to us can befall. 
There no sorrow in home shall invade, and our loved ones their more no shall die. On celestial unbroken sweet day, while eternity's ages roll by, O oh, wonderful city of God, just across in that beautiful clime, where the angels' sweet echo of song in musical cadences chime. O oh, wonderful city of God, by faith in the distance I see. There's a mansion prepared over there. Yes, a place in that city for me. Same key. Oh, for a faith that will not shrink, though passed by every foe, that will not tremble on the brink of any earthly woe, that will not murmur nor complain beneath the chastening rod. But in the hour of grief or pain, we'll lean upon its God. A faith that shines more bright and clear when tempests rage without, that when in danger knows no fear, in darkness feels no such a faith as this, and then whatever may come, we'll taste it here, the hallowed bliss of an eternal home. This song is in preparation for the Lord's table this morning. My precious Savior suffered pain, agony, he bore it all, that I might live. He broke the bonds of sin and set captives free. He bore it all, that, all that I might see his shining face. Freely bore it all. I with him like this, I stood condemned to die, but took my place before it all that I might in his presence live. They placed a crown of thorns upon the Savior's head before it all that I might live. My cruel man with spear his side was pierced and bled. All that I might in his presence, he bore it all that I'd see his shining face. Freely bore it all, I with him might live, stood condemned to die, but Jesus took my place. All that I might in his presence live. Up Calvary's hill in shade, the blessed Savior trust me for it all. That I might live. Between two thieves they crucified the Son of God. All that I might in his presence live. For it all, I might see his shining face. Freely for it all, I with him might live. Dead to die, but Jesus took my place. 
of that I might in his presence live. Good morning. It's great to see everybody here. <laughs> I thank these men for being willing to, to serve today on the Lord's table. Um, you know, we have an apostolic example in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. On the first day of the week, brothers and sisters, the saints got together and they broke bread. The cool thing is that Paul, you know, realizing he was going to leave the next day, continued his message till midnight. Sometimes I wish we'd just let her rip and do three or four hours at a time. That would be a lot of fun. Um, but if you could, open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. And if you're going to be here for the adult class, I'm, I'm teaching that um, later today. And we're going to be in Ephesians 2. So um, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13, I'll be reading 13 through 16. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 and six to through 16. It says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were far away have been bought or have been brought near by the blood of the Messiah. For he is our peace who made both groups one, and he tore down the dividing wall of hostility in his flesh. He made of no effect the law consisting of commands and expressed in regulations so that he might create in himself one new man from the two, resulting in peace. He did this so that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross and put the hostility to death by it. And over in Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. It's pretty much an exact copy of Galatians 3.13. Colossians 2.14 simply states, He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us. He took it out of the way and he nailed it to the cross. That's what Christ did for each and every one of us. He nailed it to the cross. I'm not a Jew. I'm a Gentile. There was no hope for me under the old law. But that was God's plan all along, that Christ would come down and he would tear down that dividing wall that was contrary to each and every one of us so that we could be reconciled and have that direct path to God through him. So let's not forget that sacrifice and this wonderful opportunity that we have as brothers and sisters to go directly to God through him. With the, those thoughts in mind, let's say a prayer for the cup or the bread. Father, we're indeed thankful, Lord, for this day and for the opportunity that we have to come and gather here around this table. Father, Christ was that sacrificial lamb that none of us could be. As we prepare to partake of this loaf, which represents his body, help us, Father, to remember his sacrifice of love. For it's in Christ's name we pray.
continue to pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you so much for the beautiful day you've given us, and especially for your son. We thank you for the gift that he gave us through his blessed passion and precious death for the blood that he spilt for us. We thank you for this opportunity that we have to come to you, and especially again for your son. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Everybody is just so sporadically placed that we were a mess this morning, so we really apologize. And I'd like to thank our brother Joe, who stood up um, and covered those that we missed. We did not do that intentionally, so thank you very much. Um, we also take <clears throat> this opportunity to give back as God has blessed us with um, and, and all the main blessings that, that he's given us. And if you um, consider that just for a moment, uh, Look at, look at the opportunities that we have, where we live, um, what we can do. The greatest opportunity that we have is to share the gospel with others. But God's blessed us with truly everything, and we'll take that, uh, this opportunity right now to give back to him. Would you pray with me? Lord God, I thank you for this morning that we can come here and that we can share together in, in Christ and, Lord, hear your word and, and uh, just be filled with... Uh, encouragement and, and uh, knowledge about how you lived and how you expect us to live. Father, I pray that you'll help us to use these lessons to uh, strengthen our, 
spirits and to uh, guide us in the way that we act and the things we do. Lord God, we take this time now to share uh, what we've um, obtained over the past uh, week. And Lord God, we just say thank you. We thank you for this opportunity to share. And uh, we want you to know we love you. And thank you in Jesus' name. Good morning, everybody. Today's scripture reading is from Matthew 19, 1 through 6, the subject of divorce. When Jesus has finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went into the region of Judea and the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Some of the Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any for any and every reason question. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So, no, so they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Thank you. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with love. There is only one God, there is only one King. There is only That is why we can sing. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with love. Good morning. Ray, thank you. Thank you, those who have led prayers and served around the table. It's great to have everyone out this morning and welcome to whoever's on the line. But I'd like to begin with a text because it's, I guess, been resonating in my heart the last week. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, the Hebrew writer would say, Let us not give up meeting together. And Actually, he starts before that, though. And this is the question for us. Because in verse 24, he says, Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward and good deeds. So a question for us. As you prepared and got ready to come this morning and assemble with the saints, have you considered how you might spur another brother or sister on toward love and good deeds. Have you thought of somebody? Thought of a word of encouragement, a prayer that you've lifted up for them? Because our assemblies are meant to do that. It's not just to come to hear a sermon or to break bread, but we're meant to be a community. We're meant to be a community that sees the needs of one another. Then that's not going to be done just through a few people. 
is going to be th done as the entire community of God's people. Consider how we might spur one another on toward love and good deeds. And then he says, let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. But encourage one another, and all the more as we see the day approaching. And so may we use these opportunities when we come together to be a blessing into one another's life. So there's your first sermon. <laughs> We're making a bit of a transition uh, in a lot of ways. Today is a transition in sermon topics. We've been talking about mission for the last, well, first part of the summer. In the month of August, we're going to focus on the idea of family. And I hope that you've been blessed in a way that many of us have been going through our prayer and share triplets. And as we've been going through those, especially as I've been going through it, I get together with Robert and I get together with Zach, it's made me appreciate all the different things that this congregation does in the direction that we're going. And I'm very thankful for, for Matt and Hannah being here and was reflecting that Matt, when we actually do preacher transition, uh, Matt is going to be about the same age that I was when I came here back in 1994. And I'm very thankful to be able to be a co-worker with Matt in the gospel. And I think that's been a real blessing. We talked about mission, though, and Matt and I share a common mission of trying to seek and save the lost, but also try to build up this body. Think about what we preached on the last while about people who go out into this community, not the church community, but go out into the world and are able to share the gospel, that we prepare or make enough rest or space in our life that we have opportunities, but that we also, as a church, are able to do what Jesus taught us to do in John chapter 13 and verses 34 and 35. He says, all men will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. That we're able to be a community that the world sees is different. Now, we're not going to agree on everything. But because of what we partook of in just, just a while ago, that we remembered the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, that binds us together in a way that the world does not have. And so we're able to love one another and to show that love toward, towards one another in a way that the world can't, but in a way that the world wants. I do have a question before we get into today's text, though. And that is, what are truths or concepts that began before sin in other words, before Adam and Eve rebelled against God and exist at the time when sin is no more. What are some truths or some concepts that exist before there was sin and when sin will be no more? I might need a little help on the first slide since this isn't going forward. Thanks, Diego. In other words, we want to talk about the start and the finish. What is there? Well, number one, I would say, is that God's the same. And it looks like I am stuck, Diego, so you might... Let me turn this off and on. God's one, but another concept is creation. If you think about creation, in Genesis chapter 1... We saw, see God's magnificent, just speaking everything into existence. In Genesis chapter 2, we see God getting intimate with his creation, getting his hands dirty in a sense of creating a man and a woman and the rest of creation. And when we come to Revelation, the end of Revelation, what we see is, and we'll read this in a little bit, about the idea of a new heaven and a new earth. Well, we still are going to be going to heaven, but what's happening is Jesus is able to reverse all the curses that came about because of sin. If you think about it, first curse is we were separated from God, and so we're going to be God's people. We're going to be in the presence of God. Another is we messed up our relationships with one another, and yet we're going to be the family of God. We got messed up you know, as individuals. You could call it psychological in the sense that before sin came in, there was no shame. And yet, when sin came in, there was that issue of shame. And also, 
our world has been in a position which, where it groans, looking forward to the time when Christ comes again, is what Paul would say in Romans chapter 8. And with the coming of Jesus, all of that is going to be renewed. But there's another one, and I need a forward there. <laughs> Marriage, a wedding. Listen to what the text says. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2. And here's what, the second half of verse 20. But for Adam no suitable helper was found. This is after all the animals had been created. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man the man said this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh for she was taken she shall be called woman for she was taken out of man that is why a man leaves his father and mother and he's united to his wife and they become one flesh and if we jump all the way over to revelation chapter 21 we hear this in verse 1 then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, there will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. A time when there was no sin, God institutes marriage. A time when sin will be no more. This image of, and I need you to forward again, again. This image that we have is one of a wedding. It's one of a marriage between Christ and his church. It shouldn't surprise us, because throughout the Old Testament and New Testament, we find that God will oftentimes use this idea of a marriage between himself and his people, the Israelite nation and now the church. But I find it, I guess, very encouraging to think that that out of all the different applications that God could make about a relationship between him and his church as he chooses marriage. And so I'd like us to spend some time and for us to look at this idea of marriage. And before we get into this, those who aren't married, I'm going to give you a couple pieces of advice. Number one, marry a partner, not a project. Now, we're all sort of projects. <laughs> but Sometimes, and I was guilty of this, when I would date, I would oftentimes, for some reason, choose people that needed a lot of help. <laughs> and yet, no, I needed a lot of help too, but <laughs> when I became a Christian and made a decision I wanted to follow after Christ, it dawned on me that if I'm going to be faithful and accomplish all God wants me to do, I need to find a partner, somebody who has a love for God just like I do. And so marriage is not meant to be a missionary opportunity. It's not meant to be an opportunity where you have marry a non-Christian and hope that they later become a Christian. Just a couple of pieces of advice. If you're not married yet, find somebody who's a partner, somebody more than just baptized, somebody who's really got a heart for God and work that together. Well, let's go to Matthew 19, the reading that we had. Jesus is tested. Jesus asked a question, probably originates from Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verse 1. In Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verse 1, there is a giving of a divorce. And it's basically, he says, when your wife is indecent. And so there's this big debate among the Jewish leaders about what does that mean? Does that mean that it's marital unfaithfulness? Or does it mean if she burnt a toast or she got... Uh, heavier than she should have, or some other reason can I divorce? And so the Jews were wrestling with that. So they come to Jesus and they ask, why don't you tell us about what this is all about? And what I love is that Jesus does not go into this big discussion about divorce. Now later he's going to talk about that there can be 
for marital unfaithfulness. But what he takes them back to is what marriage is meant to look like. And so let's go and look a little bit closer at Matthew 19 and verse 4 through 6. And before I do this, I want us to remember who's saying this. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh, John 1 and John 4, John 1, 1 and 1, 14. This is God Himself who's going to be speaking, who took on flesh, who, who went to a cross and died for you and me, and after three days was raised again, is ascended to the right hand of the Father, and is going to come again. The book of Revelation will call Him the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. We know him as King of kings and Lord of lords. He would say in John chapter 12 and verse 48, There is a, a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my teaching. That very word which I spoke will condemn him at the last day. Paul would say about him in Philippians chapter 2 that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The one who's going to say these words has authority Matthew 28, 18 through 20, over everything. And I think that's very important for us to recognize because we have a culture which will reject what Jesus is going to say. And we need to see Jesus elevated above this culture in which we live and elevated above any culture that there ever is. And so... Our Lord says, haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the two will become one flesh, so they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Just a few principles as we go through this. Number one, Jesus says that marriage, God's plan for marriage, transcends culture. He's saying this in the first century, and he's able to go back and look all the way back to creation. And he says it doesn't matter whether it deals with Jewish culture, it doesn't matter if it deals with Jewish law, it doesn't matter if it's dealing with the patriarchal systems. This was God's plan. I think this is so crucial at the very beginning for us to understand, is that God's plan for marriage how would I say it? It stands over anything culture has to say. So if you have culture, this hand of mine, here we have now God's teaching about marriage, which is meant to trump anything that our culture says. Jesus is at the beginning. That his definitions, God's definitions transcend culture. But then he brings out this concept. He says, the Creator made them male and female. The issue of same-sex marriage is not new in our culture today. Nero actually married two men. He marries Pythagoras. Tacitus writes about this, if you want to look it up, in his annals. In that marriage, Nero took the form of the bride. He also then later on married a fellow by the name of Sporus. In this one, he took the position of the groom. Supposedly married this young man because he looked like one of the wives that he'd had before. Maybe that's why Paul writes into Romans chapter 1 to the church at Rome about the issue of homosexuality, that, that that is against God's will because all of a sudden this church, this culture is pushing so much that even the, the rulers and the leaders of this country are saying it's okay by their example. But here's something I want to encourage us on. People who struggle with homosexuality are not to be rejected. They're to be welcomed. We don't accept that behavior, but we welcome them, teaching them the gospel with the hope that they change. And here's what Paul says about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And I think it's good for us to remember. 
Verse 9, he says, Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that's what some of you were. So he's writing to the church and says, some of you were a bunch of this stuff. But you were washed, referencing their baptism. You were sanctified. You're made holy. You were justified. God makes you just like you've never sinned. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. I would assume if we were to take a, a poll among us of who has struggled with sexual immorality before they became a Christian, there'd be a number who would say guilty. I would guess that all of us in some way have wrestled with idolatry, making something more important than God. There are probably some who have struggled with adultery, some who have stolen, some who have been greedy, some who have been drunk, and some who have slandered, and some who are swindlers. If they're welcome in the body of Christ because of the redemptive power of Jesus, then somebody who has struggled with homosexuality and has left that behind, they are welcome in the body of Christ as well. But same-sex marriage is rejected. Those who embrace it, we still need to love them and encourage them to turn towards God. But that is not God's plan for marriage. So, hear me, because I know some families within this body, this is a struggle, that I'm not trying to just you know, be harsh, but I'm trying to be true. And Jesus says, okay, I'm going to point to where marriage is meant to be, and it's meant to be between a man and a woman. He then goes on, and he talks about this idea of leaving and cleaving. That a marriage relationship is meant to be the most important physical relationship that we will have. It is more important than our parents. It is more important than our children. That making that relationship between the husband and wife is the crucial gift we can give to our children and we can give to the rest of our world. There's also another leaving and cleaving. We need to leave the trap that marriage, or let me put it a different way, we need to leave the temptation that I deserve to be happy because so many people will say, I'm not happy in this relationship, and so I'm leaving this marriage so I can be happy. There's a leaving of that. When you made a decision to follow after Jesus Christ, it was deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Him. But our culture keeps hitting us with that. If you're not happy, go ahead and find somebody else. Leave that and cleave to that spouse. And then he says within the text, You're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. God's joined us together. It's a covenant. And probably the place that deals with this issue of covenant as clearly as any place else is the book of Malachi. In Malachi chapter 2, and I'm just going to read a couple of the texts there, but in chapter 2 and verse 14, God is telling the Israelite nation, the Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. And then he goes on and he says, still in verse 14, the wife of your marriage covenant. And then in verse 16, you'll find a, different, a number of different translations here, but probably the one we're most familiar with, coming from the New Revised Standard or the King James or the New American Standard, for I hate divorce, says the Lord. Is that God is saying, I have covenant, I've been involved in this relationship, and I want you to make this thing work. Which is exactly what we see Jesus saying. 
one of the stories, and if you've been here for over 10 years, you've heard me say this story, but I haven't said it recently, just like it's probably about time I tell my golfing story that I spent the maternity Monday, um, that you can be forgiven in a marriage, but that's not today's lesson. Um, a family, a couple that I know, she had watched her parents, the parents hadn't been very good, so she wanted to marry a godly man. She's a Christian. She wants to marry a godly man, so she thinks, I'll marry a preacher. Well, preachers aren't perfect in any way, shape, or form. And after they got into their marriage relationship, they fought. Got to the point that he would take off his ring and he'd throw it across the room at her. They prayed. They knew that God hated divorce, and God had joined them together. So her prayer was that God would kill her so that her husband could remarry and find somebody to work with. The husband wasn't as generous. He prayed, God, kill one of us. (laughs) I mean, she was willing. She said, you know, take me out. He said, your choice, God. You know, it's probably going to be me, but your choice. They came to a conclusion they understood this. That God has joined us together. We're not going to separate. And they came to the conclusion, if we work as hard at putting our marriage together and having a great marriage as we do in fighting each other, what might God do? And they have got one of the most beautiful marriages that I have ever seen. Because they understood that God had joined them together and saying, man must not separate. And they were willing to do whatever it took to put that together. But I have something to introduce to you as well. It's the idea of further revelation. And what I mean by further revelation is not that we're getting a new word of the Lord. There's not uh, a book of First Scott or anything like that coming out. But the idea of further revelation is how does an inspired writer, in our situation it's going to be Paul, how does an inspired writer apply the teachings of Jesus. That's the idea of further revelation. So we've got, we've, we've explored the teachings of Jesus. So how does an inspired writer apply that? And I'd like us to turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Beginning in verse 1, it says, now for the matters you wrote about. So the church at Corinth has written to Paul the first part of 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is he's heard information from Chloe's household. But now what we're dealing with is they had some questions. They had some questions about marriage. And so we jump over to verse 10. In verse 10 it says, To the married I give this command, not I, but the Lord. Okay, got to remember here, who's this letter written to? Is it written to, to the community at Corinth? No. It's written to the church at Corinth. And so the context, when he says to the married, he's writing to a Christian married to a Christian. And he says, not I, but the Lord. So he is pointing back to whether it be in Matthew 19 here, or in Mark, or in Luke, he's pointing back to what Jesus has already taught. He says, not I. The Lord's already taught about this. He's already taught about covenant people. And this is what he says. A wife must not separate from her husband, but if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and a husband must not divorce his wife. I'd like to read, and I probably should have put it up here on the screen, but this comes from uh, Richard Oster, Dr. Oster. He was one of my professors, one of Matt's professors at Harding School of Theology. He's our Greek professor. He's the one that I had Greek readings and you had to memorize every Greek word within the New Testament that was used five times or more, which is a whole lot. And this is what he writes about this. He wrote a commentary on 1 Corinthians. He says, even though translations often render the Greek word charizomai as separate, which it clearly can mean, in Greek literature and legal documents, it also existed as a technical term for divorce. One must be careful not to impose a modern legal understanding of marriage and separation onto Greco-Roman jurisprudence. The Greek word charizomai is also used of the dissolution of a marriage between a believer and a non-believer, 
when the non-believer wants to end the marriage. 1 Corinthians 7, 15. Moreover, Paul refers to the marital status of the woman who initiated the action of charismai, separation, as unmarried. And so, here's as we take a look at this. He says, okay, a wife can't separate from her husband. A Christian wife can't separate, can't divorce her husband. And then he says, okay, if she, if she rejects that teaching, if she disobeys that teaching, here's what has to happen. She has to remain unmarried or be reconciled. Those are the two options for a Christian marrying to a Christian. And then he says, a husband cannot divorce his wife. So what we see within this application is that Paul is making it very clear that Christian married to a Christian coming into this covenant relationship, that bond is not meant to be broken. And if it is broken, it has to stay broken or be reconciled, and they cannot seek another spouse. Paul then deals with the issue of a not Christian married to a non-Christian. And just real quickly, I'll read through this. It says, to the rest, I say this, in other words... He's going to deal with a Christian married to a non-Christian. I, not the Lord. In other words, Jesus hasn't taught about this specific situation. And so I'm going to share by inspiration what God's wanting us to do. And that's why he says I. Okay, not meaning he's stepping out of inspiration. He's just saying Jesus hasn't taught about this. So let me share with the church by inspiration what they need to do. If any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. How do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? So a Christian married to a non-Christian, stay in there. Unless that non-Christian leaves. And so what does he say about a non-Christian married to a non-Christian? Nothing. Nothing. I think it's a real danger for us as a church to say something that is binding in the sense of a marriage when an inspired writer doesn't apply what Jesus taught to a non-Christian married to a non-Christian. I think he gives indication what to do later on. Stay in the condition which you became a Christian in. So let me just sort of share some things to wrap up. When we think of marriage, it was blessed before sin. And this issue of a wedding or a marriage is fulfilled with the church when Christ returns. And so this concept of marriage, just imagine it this way, that an, a rib was taken from Adam and created a woman. And what you're doing is you're joining them together once again in a relationship that is meant to last a lifetime. A relationship that's meant to last a lifetime. So one last illustration. I know our time is running out. Two boxes. Sadly, in our culture today, what, we're, what we've taught, and just our culture has taught it, I'm not saying it's church we've taught it, that we look out for someone who we will marry in the sense that they're the bigger box. They, they're more beautiful than anybody else. We love them more than anybody else. They've got more power than somebody else. There's more prestige. There, there's something more about them. And so when we enter into the marriage relationship, we expect them to add to us. We expect them to fulfill us in different ways. And so what happens is that bigger box, because we've chosen the best, is we keep reaching out or, and reaching into that box and pulling out and pulling out and pulling out and eventually that box is empty. A more biblical view of marriage would be, let's assume that smaller box doesn't have a bottom. And so the issue is that we become like Jesus and rather than taking out, we put in 
something that encourages, something that supports, something that's needed. And we become a servant in that relationship. And when we choose to be servants rather than the ones who are served, I believe that we're able to live those kind of marriages that Jesus said that at the beginning God made them male and female. And this is meant to last for all eternity. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. May our marriages show that. May the way we treat each other glorify God and bring honor and glory through our homes to God. If you have a need today, this has been more of an instructive sermon, not so much a moving, but if there's some a need for prayers, why don't you come? Just together we stand and sing. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yield it and still. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Wash me just now, as in thy presence, humbly I bow. And we'll cut it off right there. Please be seated. Well, we didn't have any uh, extra requests come in online uh, for prayer this morning, but... Uh, Certainly want to pray for the message. Uh, appreciate what Scott had to say. A difficult subject in our culture. Um, something that probably has affected all of us directly or indirectly at some time. Um, God is good. God knows the right way to, for things to work. and They don't work very well when we don't do them His way. It's really as simple as that. Thanks for the message, Scott. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you love us so much. And you want the very, very best for us, and you gave us the very best. Father, not only did you give us an amazing world to live in, and amazing uh, lives to live, and amazing opportunities to enjoy those lives, Father. But Father, you've also uh, given us uh, the opportunity for relationships and, and those relationships, Father, our relationship with you is to be modeled after our relationship with one another, and particularly uh, in marriage relationships, Father. It's so powerful and Father, throughout history, man has messed that up. Father, we've been, we've been selfish, we've made bad decisions. And Father, we're so thankful that uh, your love, mercy and grace uh, can ultimately cover anything, Father, if, if we're willing to, uh, to yield to you. And Father, I, I know that this is a difficult message this morning for some and, and really for all of us in a way, Father. Uh, it's a, marriage can be such a beautiful thing and as many of us know, it can also be very awful and difficult at times. But Father, uh, this really is an amazing amazing uh, place that we live in and our lives can be so very very amazing and, and so very good and and so bountiful in so many many ways when we just live and do things the way that you've instructed us to father father you've given us no instruction that wasn't meant for our good that wasn't meant to make our lives a whole lot better father i just pray that uh, you would be with uh, 
each and every one of us, Father, and wherever uh, we're at in our lives and in our relationships, whether we're still single, whether we've struggled, whether we've been divorced, whatever the situation is, Father, to, to reach out to you and to, and to understand and to, how much you love us and care for us. And you always, every, every minute of every day, Father, you want the very best for us. And Father, I pray that you'd forgive our culture that has uh, gone so far like so many cultures throughout history have so far away from your plan. Father, help us to be your vessels for honor and, and your examples for honor and, and, uh, and certainly uh, for healing and uh, for restoration uh, to a country and to a world that so badly needs that. Father, uh, your plan is so good and it's so amazing when we follow it. And just like even in Pam and I's relationship, we've had our struggles. God, thank you for giving me such a godly wife. Father, we do pray uh, that you'd be with those that are struggling today, especially be with, uh, with Tony and Norm. Father, I pray that Norm's okay and that the doctor's able to minister to him and you give him comfort and peace that he needs. And, and all the other things going on, Father, uh, kids at camp and other relationships that may be struggling. Uh, Father, uh, we just pray that uh, each and every one of us would uh, do everything that we can to stay true to you and, to, and really to, trace, to stay true to one another, Father. Uh, we all have difficulties in this life, and, and we need, uh, and we fellowship together, Father, to encourage one another to the love and good deeds that you have called us all to. And again, I just thank you for your forgiveness, and most importantly, Father, where would we be without Jesus? And I pray this all in his precious name. Amen. Due to time constraints, we are dismissed. <laughs>